if you remember earlier on in this lesson, as we were taking a look at Deuteronomy 28, specifically that 68th verse that talked about returning to bondage in ships. And there is a running theory that that was a reference to the transatlantic slave trade, which would then mean that those slaves would have been Hebrew Israelites, which would then mean that those slaves would have been Hebrew Israelites, which would then mean that those slaves would have been Hebrew Israelites. So the first thing that I want to do is I, I want to reference uh, some comments that I was able to see last week as a result of the message going forth. And these comments are evidence that we're getting new watchers, uh, uh, new viewers, maybe even new trolls every week. And so, there were some comments regarding uh, what I said about Africans selling Africans to Europeans. Now, if you remember earlier on in this lesson, as we were taking a look at Deuteronomy 28, specifically that 68th verse that talked about returning to bondage in ships. And there is a running theory that that was a reference to the transatlantic slave trade, which would then mean that those slaves would have been Hebrew Israelites. Now, emphatically, I wholeheartedly believe and don't see how it could be refuted that in West Africa, before the slave trade began, there were Jews. After Assyrian captivity, captivity of uh, Israel and the ten tribes that are considered lost, of course, the book of Revelation shows us that they definitely are here, present in this world. I believe that all of the groups that we've identified uh, that would be considered Israel. And I don't know if anyone would specifically know. But with, with all the groups that we've identified, I'm sure we've covered those ten lost tribes. But after Assyrian captivity, going back to around 730 B.C., a little bit after that, many Israelites migrated to North Africa. And from North Africa to West Africa. So you have Jews that... that set up shop, set up home in North Africa, as well as West, Central, East, and South, different groups. But one of the questions that we ask regarding those from West Africa making their way to this country, of course, by force, is that were they all Hebrew Israelites? It's believed that 12 million to 12.8 million Africans were brought over to this country. Based on the comments that I was reading last week, the assumption is that they were all Hebrew Israelites. I don't know if we can say that with certainty. Now, because they were in West Africa, it would make sense that some would have been taken as well. But I believe it was a mix, an amalgamation of West Africans and West African Jews. Another comment that I saw was that Ham is not the father of the Negroes. And the Negro in this country came from West Africa. Well, that is true. I mentioned to you the Zondervan Compact Study Bible, which highlights, they don't elaborate on it. They don't go into further detail but it highlights that Ham did not father the Negroes. That only leaves Shem. Now, we prove that by way of Ephor, one of the sons of Midian, a son of the union of Abraham and Keturah in Genesis 25. We make distinctions between what it means biblically to be a Hebrew, an Israelite, and a Jew. We went through all of that in detail. However, it could be a stretch to believe that only, only Africans sold Hebrew Israelites to Europeans to be brought over to this country. Now, here's why I say that. 
I want to introduce you to two websites. I think you should go check these out on your own time. One in particular, in particular, slavevoyages.org. Slavevoyages.org. Did you know that you can go online and look at the slave databases? Slavevoyages.org. Let me read you a little bit about this particular website and what they do. Transatlantic Slave Trade Database. The Transatlantic Slave Trade Database now comprises 36,000 individual slaving expeditions between 1514 and 1866. Records of the voyages have been found in archives and libraries throughout the Atlantic world. They provide information about vessels, routes, and the people associated with them, both enslaved and enslavers. Sources are cited for every voyage included. Users may search for information about a spe specific voyage or a group of voyages. The website provides full interactive capability to analyze the data and report results in the form of statistical tables, graphs, maps, a timeline, and an animation. That's slavevoyages.org.org. Another section within the website, Intra-American Slave Trade Database. The Intra-American Slave Trade Database contains information on approximately 10,000 slave voyages within the Americas. These voyages operated within colonial empires across imperial boundaries and inside the borders of nations such as the United States and Brazil. The database enables users to explore the contours of the enormous New World slave trade, which not only dispersed African survivors of the Atlantic crossing, but also displaced and enslaved people born in the Americas. Now here's the section I spent a little time on yesterday. And that is the African Names Database. The African Names Database. Once again, this website is slavevoyages.org. The African Names Database. The African Names Database provides personal details of 91,491 Africans taken from captured slave ships or from African trading sites. It displays the African name, age, gender, origin, country, and places of embarkation, and disembarkation of each individual. Now, it is believed that the 12 million to 12.8 million West Africans brought over to this country, that anywhere between 2 and 4 million died during the voyage to the Americas. This African Names Database highlights 91,000. We know there were more than 91,491 Africans taken but this does give us something to work with. Now you can go on this website, you can access the database and you can see a list of names. I didn't have time to look at 91,000 names, but I did look at a few. I looked at a few in the beginning of the database and at the end. Interestingly, I saw no Hebrew names. Now here's what we have to remember about Hebrew culture, about the Hebrew people. They pass traditions on, generation to generation. You're not a Jew, you're not an Israelite, you're not a Hebrew, and you forget who your fathers are. That doesn't happen. So interestingly, if West Africans or the West Africans that were taken to the Americas were only and only Hebrew Israelites, then these databases should be listed with names that are of Hebrew origin only. Now, I have been on search for a database that supposedly highlights names mixed with African names, like a Jacob here and a Nathan here. I haven't seen that yet. I did not find that on slavevoyages.org, but supposedly it's out there. And if it does exist, then that speaks to exactly what I've been saying this entire time, that the West Africans taken would have been a mix of both West Africans native to Africa as well as West African Jews that came from North Africa that came or whose forefathers came out of Assyrian captivity. Here's another website you might want to check out, enslaved.org. Enslaved, E-N-S-L-A-V-E-D dot O-R-G. This website is somewhat different. 
you can start a search across 871,751 records from the historical slave trade. You just type in a name and you hit search. So I started typing names in. I typed in Abraham, found 706 entries for Abraham. Typed in Jacob, I found over 1,200 entries for Jacob. Meaning that there were over 700 slaves, easily could have been more, named Abraham, over 1,200 named Jacob. But here's the question. Are these names only names of origin or did it include slave names as well? So I started looking at some slave names. Typed in Jim, got over 260 entries. I also typed in the name of the slave whose work, whose material I've referenced numerous times, Olauda Equiano. I'm going to actually read some portions of his book today. Typed in Olauda, and I got one entry. There was only one Olauda. So this seems to be a database that has the list of African names or names of uh, birth names of slaves, but also their slave names as well, whereas the previous website I mentioned does not have the slave names. It only has the names of birth, the names of origin. But you can check these out on your own time. I'm sure you could potentially spend a lot of time. But based on these databases, there are supposedly others out there. Slave Voyages seems to be the most popular. Slavevoyages.org is the sister website to AfricanOrigins.org, which I did not have any success locating last night. But nevertheless, this information is out there for you to find. So based on last night's research, it appears that the 12 to 12.8 million West Africans taken from West Africa to the Americas was a mix of both West Africans as well as West African Jews. Now. There were eight principal areas used by Europeans to buy and sell slaves. Eight principal areas. Senegambia, Senegal and Gambia, or Gambia. Upper Guinea, uh, which included Sierra Leone. The Windward Coast, Liberia and Ivory Coast. Gold Coast, Ghana and east of Ivory Coast. Bight of Benin, Togo, Benin, and Nigeria, west of the Niger Delta. Bight of Biafra, Nigeria, east of the Niger Delta, Cameroon, Equatorial Guinea, and Gabon. West Central Africa, Republic of Congo, Democratic Republic of, of Congo and Angola. And Southeastern Africa, Mozambique and Madagascar. These eight principal areas on their own would prove that it was not only Hebrew Israelites or Jews, depending on how you want to use the terms, if you're using them from their original meaning, biblical meaning, or if you're using them as synonymous, interchangeable terms, it's clear that the 12.8 million consisted of an amalgamation of West Africans. The 10 most prominent ethnic groups brought to the Americas were the Bakongo of the Democratic Republic of Congo and Angola, uh, the Mande of Upper Guinea, the GBE speakers of Togo, Ghana, and Benin, the Akan of Ghana and Ivory Coast, the uh, Wolof of Senegal and Gambia, uh, the Ibu of southeastern Nigeria, the, Mabu the, Mab the Mabundu of Angola, the Yoruba of southwestern Nigeria, the Chamba of Cameroon, and the Makua of Mozambique. So interestingly, it's not just West Africa, but it was also West Central Africa and Southeastern Africa as well. Now, I want to read a couple of passages from Olauda's book. The book was entitled, or is entitled, The Interesting Life of Olauda Equiano, or Gustavus Vasa, his slave name, written by himself, the autobiography that helped influence British lawmakers to abolish the slave trade. And remember, uh, UK Parliament abolished the slave trade in 1807. I want to go to chapter one. Now I'm reading from my Kindle. 
And when I looked at my iPad as well as my iPhone, uh, the Kindle locations were not exactly the same. So I'm going to give you um, what they are on my device. If you ever decide to get this book for yourself, if you ever decide to get the hardback, the page number I give you may not be exactly the same, but it, uh, it is all found in chapter one. All that I'm going to read is found in chapter one. And remember, I told you before, chapter one of this book has about 260 to 300 pages in chapter one alone. The entire book has about 3,100 to 3,200 pages. So it would definitely take you some time to, um, to, to, to read the entirety of this book. And now that I think about it, I really have to give my dad a shout out for doing race, religion, and racism because he read 300 books. He read 300 books from start to finish, and he did not have the benefit of digital books. One of the advantages that I have is that I can buy a book and type in a keyword and go to those specific pages. He read, before he even touched the lesson, three years of study, 300 books, start to finish. Two of those books he read, the entire Quran and the entire Hadith, just so he could be prepared to deliver this message. He's in a class by himself, that's for sure. Okay, so I want to read a couple of passages from Olauda's book. And we will see what is revealed. Now, this is from chapter one. Once again, the interesting narrative of the life of Olauda Equiano or Gustavus Vasa. This is chapter one, location 199. And it reads, we practiced circumcision like the Jews. He was Ibu. He was Ibu. Now, when you study the Ibu, you find that Amongst the Ibu were a group of Ibu Jews. So some believe there were Ibu Jews amongst the Ibu. Some believe all of the Ibu were Jews. Olauda doesn't seem to articulate that in his writing. He says, we practice circumcision like the Jews and made offerings and feasts on the occasion or on that occasion in the same manner as they did. Like them also, our children were named from some event some circumstance or fancied foreboding at the time of their birth. I want to read that again. Like them, and right, he's talking about his tribe, the Ibu, and he's saying, like the Jews, we practice circumcision, made offerings, feasts on that occasion in the same manner as they did. And then he says this, like them also, our children were named from some event, some circumstance or fancied foreboding at the time of their birth. Let me give you two examples. When Noah was born, what did Lamech say about him? He will bring us rest. Noah means what? Noah means rest. In other words, the majority of these children, unless God said this is what his name would be, the majority of the children that we read about in the Old Covenant, their names were given to them at the time of their birth based on the circumstances. In other words... <laughs> using one of the children born in the book of Genesis, chapter 10, the table of nations, using Cush as an example. When Cush was born, Ham clearly said, goodness, that boy is black. I'm going to call him black. Because that's what Cush means. Cush means black. So Olauda is saying, once again, like them, the Jews, also our children, were named from some event, some circumstance, or fancied foreboding at the time of their birth. I was named Olauda. Now, why wouldn't he have been given a Hebrew name? Like I said, I don't care how long it's been. Hebrew people do not forget who they are. They do not forget their forefathers. They do not forget Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I was named Olauda, which in our language signifies vicissitude or fortune also. One favored in having a loud voice and well spoken. Okay, now I'm going to look at location in the same chapter, 204. Location 204 in chapter 1 of the interesting narrative of the life of Olauda Equiano. 
I have before remarked that the natives of this part of Africa are extremely clean. This necessary habit of decency was with us as a part of religion. And therefore, we had many purifications and washings. So Alauda is proving that the assumption that Africans were dirty and nasty and filthy animals, he eliminates that right here. He says it was a part of our customs to be clean based on our purification rites alone. He says uh, uh, the necessary habit of decency was with us as a part of religion, and therefore we had many purifications and washings, indeed almost as many, and used on the same occasion, if my recollection does not fail me, as the Jews. Those that touched the dead at any time were obliged to wash and purify themselves before they could enter a dwelling house. Every woman, too, at certain times was forbidden to come into a dwelling house or touch any person or anything we ate. I was so fond of my mother, I could not keep from her or avoid touching her at some of those periods, in consequence of which I was obliged to be kept out with her in a little house made for that purpose till offering was made and then we were purified. Same chapter. Location. 236. Location 236. Okay. Such is the imperfect sketch my memory has furnished me with of the manners and customs of a people among whom I first drew my breath. And as I'm reading different passages in this book, I'm just, I'm in awe of this man who was a slave, who became educated, who got saved, and then wrote a 3,000 page a uh, 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 book that was so informative it caused the UK to abolish slavery or greatly influenced. Such is the imperfect sketch my memory has furnished me with of the manners and customs of a people among whom I first drew my breath. And here I cannot forbear suggesting what has long struck me very forcibly, namely the strong analogy which even by this sketch imperfect as it is, appears to prevail in the manners and customs of my countrymen, he says, and those of the Jews, before they reached the land of promise, and particularly the patriarchs, while they were yet in that pastoral state, farming, agriculture, which is described in Genesis, an analogy which alone would induce me to think that the one people had sprung from the other. Now, this was his theory. I shared this with you before, and it took us to Flavius Josephus. It took us to Genesis 25. Um, and so, and so he, he had a wonder because of the similarities between his people, the Ibu, and the Jews. He makes this statement in his book. He says... That alone would induce me to think that the one people, the Ibu, had sprung from the other, the Jews. And then he goes into the theory about Abraham fathering Africa. Now, let's be very specific. When we look at the table of nations, 70 nations highlighted in Genesis 10. Before that, there, there are, there's no talk. In the first nine chapters of Scripture, there's no talk about nations. It's just the seed of Adam. That's it. We get to Genesis 10. The table of nations are produced as a result of Noah's three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. When we get to Ham, who is recognized as fathering the southern people. Now, south of what? South of where Shem was and where Japheth was, where their seed ended up taking residence. But when we look in Genesis 10, we only see Ham fathering the northern portion of Africa. North Africa and Northeast Africa. That's it. There's nothing about Ham producing any children that would take up residence in the remainder of the landmass, the continent that we call Africa. So where then did those people come from? Did they migrate from North Africa only? Well, Olauda has this theory and he was able to confirm what he believes, some, some may refute it, or, or, or no, not refute it, but not, disagree, not agree with it. 
but he looked at the works of some respected theologians and found that they believed the exact same thing. So let me read that last part again, which alone would induce me to think that the one people had sprung from the other. Indeed, this is the opinion of Dr. Gill. Remember Dr. John Gill, who in his commentary on Genesis very ably deduces the pedigree of the Africans. The pedigree of the Africans. Why does he word it this way? Well, when you go back to Scripture, notice in Scripture, you, you don't find the word Africa in Scripture. As a matter of fact, you don't find any of the names of the continents in Scripture except one, and that's Asia. Nineteen times you find the word Asia in the Bible. But when you read it in its context, using Acts chapter 2 as a prime example, you can see that Asia clearly is not identified as a continent in the early days of the church, but rather a region comprised of two, three, maybe four countries, but not an entire continent. You don't find that. You don't find North America, South America. You don't find Australia, Antarctica, Africa in the Bible, because back then continents didn't have names. I'm going to get into that in a little bit. So indeed, this is the opinion of Dr. Gill, who in his commentary on Genesis, he says he very ably deduces the pedigree of the Africans from Afra and Afra. Now, I'm not sure who this Afra was, but, but when I first came across this, Afra, what are you talking about Afra? And then it talks about Abraham and his African wife. And, and, and I mean, and I just, I was just baffled for the longest because the only African wife I was aware of was Hagar, who came from Egypt. But that union gave us who? Gave us Ishmael, not this Afra character. So the only other wife after Sarah and after Hagar that Abraham had was this Keturah. Now, the Bible doesn't give us any detail on this woman. She just shows up in Genesis 25. Some say she was an Arab woman. Some say she was an African woman. The book of Jasher says she was a Canaanite woman. There doesn't seem to be much agreement on it. I lean more towards the Arab African uh, 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 origin. And hopefully we'll have some time so that I can explain to you why I firmly believe that. But Dr. John Gill, Dr. John Gill says, by way of Abraham and Keturah, and if you read verse 4 of Genesis 25, Epher, E-P-H-E-R, Epher, and Josephus talks about Epher. So, uh, John Gill Dr. Gill very ably deduces the pedigree of the Africans from Afra and Afra, the descendants of Abraham by Keturah, his wife and concubine, for both these titles are applied to her. It is also comfortable, it is also conformable to the sentiments of Dr. John Clark. This is another individual like Dr. John Gill who supports this theory. Formerly Dean of uh, Serum in his Truth of the Christian Religion, both these authors concur in ascribing to us this original. The reasonings of these gentlemen are still further confirmed by the scripture chronology, and if any further cooperation were required, this resemblance in so many respects is a strong evidence in support of the opinion. Like the Israelites in their primitive state, our government was conducted by our chiefs or judges, our wise men and elders and the head of a family with us enjoyed a similar authority over his household with that which is ascribed to Abraham and the other patriarchs. The law of retaliation obtained almost universally with us as with them, and even their religion appeared to have shed upon us a ray of its glory through broken or though broken and spent in its passage or eclipsed by the cloud with which time, tradition, and ignorance might have enveloped it. For we had our circumcision, a rule, I believe, peculiar to that people. We all know what the Bible said, that the child would be circumcised on the eighth day. So Isaac was then circumcised on the eighth day. Ishmael had already been born. He then was circumcised at 13, and all the men of Abraham's house were also circumcised. But moving forward, when one was born, they'd be circumcised on day eight. He says, we also had our sacrifices and burnt offerings, our washings and purifications on the same occasion as they had. This is why he believes that quite possibly the Ibu 
came out of the Jews, or if anything, the Ebu came out of Abraham. As to the difference of color between the Ebuan, uh, the Ebuan Africans and the modern Jews, I shall not presume to account for it. It is a subject which has engaged the pens of men of both genius and learning, and it is far above my strength. The most able and reverend Mr. T. Clarkson, however, in his much admired essay on the slavery and commerce of the human species, has asserted the cause in a manner that at once solves every objection on that account and, on my mind, at least has produced the fullest conviction. I shall therefore refer to that performance for the theory, contenting myself with extracting a fact as related by Dr. Mitchell. Remember, what I'm reading was written by a slave who became free, written by a black man who was considered an animal and considered stupid. His book would go along, would go on to influence the UK's abolishment of slavery. The Spaniards who have inhabited America under the torrid zone for any time are become as dark colored as our native Indians of Virginia, of which I myself have been a witness. Okay, this is Olauda. He is uh, quoting Reverend M.T. Clarkson as well as Dr. Mitchell in this particular part of his book. He says, there is also another instance of a Portuguese a settlement at Matumba, a river in Sierra Leone, where the inhabitants are bred from a mix mixture of the first Portuguese discoverers with the natives and are now become in their complexion and in the woolly quality of their hair, perfect Negroes, retaining, however, a smattering of the Portuguese language. So he's basically giving you an explanation as to how you can see shades of Africa all over the world. And yet the language that might come out of this one black skinned individual's mouth is Spanish or this one is Portuguese, or this one another language that's not of African origin. These instances, and a great many more which might be adduced, while they show how the complexions <clears throat> of the same persons vary in different climates, it is hoped may tend also to remove the prejudice that some conceive against the natives of Africa on account of their color. Surely the minds of the Spaniards did not change with their complexions. Are there not causes enough to which the apparent inferiority of an African may be ascribed without limiting the goodness of God and supposing he forbore to stamp understanding on certainly his own image because carved in ebony? In other words, making a separate case for a black skinned individual coming from the land that we know as Africa. Might it not naturally be ascribed to their situation when they come among Europeans? They are ignorant of their language, religion, manners, and customs. Are any pains taken to teach them these? Are they treated as men? Remember, this is in the 1700s that he's writing this. Does not slavery itself depress the mind and, ex and extinguish all its fire and every noble sentiment? But above all, what advantages do not a refined people possess over those who are rude and uncultivated? Let the polished and haughty European recollect that his ancestors were once like the Africans, uncivilized and even barbarous. Did nature make them inferior to their sons? And should they too have been made slaves? Every rational mind answers no. Let such reflections as these melt the pride of their superiority into sympathy for the wants and miseries of their sable brethren and compel them to acknowledge that understanding is not confined to feature or color. If when they look around the world, they feel exultation, let it be tempered with benevolence to others and gratitude to God who hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and whose wisdom is not our wisdom, neither our ways his ways. That's how he ends his first chapter. So these are some, some readings from his book. And one of the last things that I read, once again, highlights this Dr. John Gill and Dr. John Clark theory as to how Abram would have fathered all of the land 
south of North Africa. It wouldn't have been called North Africa back then. What was it called? It was called Cush. It was called Mizraim. It's called Canaan. It's called Put. Now, what I want to do is I want to pull up uh, map number seven, image number seven. And this is a map of uh, one of the uh, uh, ancient world maps. Now, I want to zoom in. Let's zoom in on the continent of Africa. That's going to be image uh Do you guys have that image? Okay, well, if you, if you, if you don't have it, put up, the, put up the other image. Go ahead and put the other one back up. Put that up until you have it. If you don't have it, no problem. So I don't know if you can see this on your screens, but if you look at the image or the portion of this map that says that's the continent of Africa, what are you going to read? It reads Libya or Africa. Libya or Africa. Because in ancient days, the northern part of the continent of Africa was known as Libya. As a matter of fact, it was Libya up until Egypt, going into Canaan, going into the rest of the Fertile Crescent. Once again, as I said before, you don't have names of continents laid out in the scriptures. You only have names of nations. All right, so what did Ham give us again? Ham gave us put, that was Libya. But as you notice, that says Libya or Africa because all of North Africa was considered Libya. That included Algeria, Tunisia, Morocco, up until the point where Libya would go into Egypt. That was Mizraim's territory. That was Egypt. Now, right under Egypt would be Sudan. At the border, the southern border of Egypt, the northern border of Sudan was the kingdom of Cush. That's where Cush set up his kingdom. So Cush's kingdom, Cush, which means Ethiopia, but not only did Cush produce Ethiopia, Cush produces Sudan, specifically the kingdom of Cush at the border of Egypt and Sudan, as well as the rest of what's known as the Horn of Africa. And that would be what? Eritrea. That would be Somalia. Now, um, it doesn't look like we have uh, the zoom in. So under where it says, or Africa, where West Africa is, it says uh, Negrute. So, so clearly that word um, most likely predates Nigeria or Niger. So coming from a biblically historical position, if you notice, there are so many names of so many countries that are not included in Scripture. And why is that? Well, that's because either they went by other names or those were territories that had yet to be discovered. Now, put up the image of uh, uh, map number eight. Map number eight. Okay, what are we looking at here? We're looking at the southern portion of the continent of Africa. But notice what it says here on this map. It says Ethiopia, and then it says unexplored region. It says Ethiopia, unexplored region. Now, specifically, this is not where Ethiopia is, but remember, when Ham produced his children, all there was was Libya, Ethiopia, and Egypt. So the northern half of the continent of Africa, once again, it wouldn't have been called Africa back then, but the northern half of that that continent, that landmass that we, of course, today know as Africa, that was, simp that was all of Ham's territory, and it was simply divided up between Libya, Ethiopia, and Egypt. Now, let's go to Genesis 10, 6. Yep, I believe we're going to have enough time to do this. Genesis 10, 6, back to the table of nations, because there is something I would like for you all to see. Okay, verse 6 reads, the, the sons of Ham were Cush, Mizraim, Put, and Canaan. Then it says the sons of Cush or the sons of Ethiopia or the sons of black. So that means Ethiopia means black. Cush means black. Ethiopia means black. Cush, Ethiopia, same thing, biblically speaking. The sons of Cush were Seba or Seba, Havila, Sabta, Ra'ama, and Sabteka. And then the sons of Ra'ama were Sheba, and Dudan. I was led to do another study on 
this figure known as the Queen of Sheba. We see her encounter with Solomon in the scriptures. We're never told her name, interestingly. She's just the queen of a place. A place called what? A place called Sheba. Now, we know Sheba traces its origin back to the table of nations coming from the line of Ham, based on what we just read in these two verses. So, Ra'amah had a son named Sheba. Eventually, Sheba would produce what? Sheba would produce a line. Posterity. And this queen of Sheba, whom some refer to as Bilquis, but no one is certain that that's what her name was. They just know she was a queen of Sheba. And the running theory has been that she comes out of Ethiopia or Arabia. Ethiopia or Arabia. I've talked about this Arabian-Ethiopian connection before, but I believe I have discovered something that'll really seal it. So, Sheba went by another name, Saba or Siba. You, you can actually see this name here in verse 7. And there have been some wonders and curiosities as to where Sheba was located. When you, when you look up Sheba in James Strong's Concordance, interestingly, two definitions stand out. One definition is an Arabian tribe. Another definition is a district in Ethiopia. Now, when you look on the map, you can see where Ethiopia is and you can see where Arabia is. They are not the same country, but they are in close proximity. As of today, Arabia is considered Western Asia, whereas Ethiopia is considered uh, Eastern Africa. Has that always been the case? I think not. Now, some of the, the places believed to how Sheba was Ethiopia, Yemen, where's Yemen at? That's south of Arabia. Yemen, Ethiopia, Somalia, and Eritrea, all areas in the Horn of Africa, which all come from Cush. Now, let's look at, in Genesis 10, verse 25, which reads, To Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg, in his days, the earth was divided and his brother's name was Joktan. And then we get all of Joktan's kids here. Joktan begot Almadad, Shalef, Hazar Maveth, Yerah, Hadoram, Yazal, Dikla, Obal, Abimael. And then it says Sheba. Wait a minute, I just read Sheba in verse 7. Sheba coming from Cush. Now I'm reading about Sheba coming from Shem. Then verse 29 says Ophir, Havila. Wait a minute, didn't I also just read Havila coming from Ham? Now I'm reading about a Havila coming from Shem. It says in Yobab, all these were sons of Joktan. Now it's interesting that these two sons of Eber are highlighted. One's name was Peleg. The Bible says in the days of his birth, or in his days, it says the earth was what? The earth was divided. Peleg's name means what? It means division but it also means earthquake. Remember what Olauda was talking about, how the Ibu would name their children in the same vein as the way the Jews would name their children, the way Lamech named Noah, the way Ham named Cush. So Eber names one child Peleg because in the days of his birth, there was a great earthquake. Now, I firmly believe, and many other theologians support this, that when Peleg was born, the great earthquake that separated the supercontinent, the one landmass, most popularly known as Pangaea. Can we put up map nine? I found this really cool map of Pangaea, the supercontinent. All right, so here you see the one landmass. Now, what's interesting about this is that it's been modernized. All right, so the names of our nations today are on this, the modern names of our nations are on this super landmass. This is what Pangaea would have looked like. All right, now just take that in for a second. Let me read a few more scriptures for you. Genesis 25, we're going to go back to Genesis 25. This is where we read about Keturah and Abraham. But well, we're going to point out something here that we saw in Genesis 10. Genesis 25, 1 says, Abraham again took a wife and her name was Keturah, and she bore him Zimron, Jackson, Madan, Midian, Ishbak, and Shua. Jackson begot there's Sheba again. All right. Now, 
I read about Sheba coming from the line of Ham, which covers the northern territory of Africa. And I also read about a Sheba coming from Shem. I read about a Havilah coming from Ham and also read about a Havilah coming from Shem. How can Sheba and Havilah come from both Ham and Shem? Watch this. Shem who gives us Arabia and Ham who gives us Ethiopia. And then we see Sheba and Dedan again. Dedan was mentioned in uh, uh, Genesis 10-7. Sheba and Dedan. Dedan is identified as a territory in Ethiopia. Who is this Jokshin? This Jokshin here, very similar to the name Jokshin in Genesis 10, both Jokshin and Jokshin are the names of Arabian patriarchs. The names of Arabian patriarchs. Now, I shared with you last week that I was watching the movie uh, One Night in Miami. Uh, Amazon Prime, very good movie. Most of the movie is spent in a hotel room, and you're, and you're going to be intrigued. All right, four individuals, Muhammad Ali, Malcolm X, uh, Jim Brown, and Sam Cooke. All right, there's a scene in the movie. I meant to actually get the, uh, uh, to watch this scene again so I can, so I can get the lines exactly. But there's a scene where they go to the roof. And Malcolm begins to talk about how he's going to take his trip to Mecca. Right? It's important in the life of a Muslim that they make a pilgrimage to Mecca and Medina. Just like it's important for a believer or even a, a Hebrew to take a trip, a Mecca, to Jerusalem. So Malcolm begins to talk about this trip that he's going to take to uh, Mecca. He tells Muhammad Ali, you should come with me. Muhammad Ali is like, sounds like a plan. I'm paraphrasing. They mentioned it to Jim Brown. And I found it very interesting how Jim responded to Malcolm's invitation. Now, what would make Regina King, she was the director of this film, what would make her in 2021, while making a, a period piece that, that takes place in the 50s and the 60s, what, what would make her write this particular line what Jim Brown says in response to Malcolm's invitation to come with him to Arabia, to Mecca. Jim Brown begins to mention how he would love to see those African women. Wait a minute. Why would he say that? Why would Jim Brown, when referring to Arabia, call their women African? It's Arabia, right? Isn't that Asia? Pull up map 10. We're, gonna, we, we're, we're zooming in on a portion of uh, Pangaea. Okay. Okay, that looks like, that doesn't look like the right portion. Um, okay, no problem. We know how to make it work. Because I'm not seeing... I'm not seeing uh, Ethiopia. Are you guys seeing Ethiopia back there? No? Okay, so the image got messed up. No problem. We roll with the punches. Okay, so this, this it was my intent. Maybe I took the, 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 the image incorrectly. Anyway, I'm, I'm focusing on this portion of Pangaea. Go ahead and put up map nine. Put map nine up again. Put up the entirety. All right, it's going to be small, but we'll work with that. So put up. Okay. So if you look at this map, you can see Africa, right? You can see to, to, to the left, you see the United States. You see South America. There's Brazil right there. And you go, go east, and you'll see where Arabia is in relation. As a matter, it's, it's like Arabia, like a puzzle piece. It just folds right in and connects right there to Ethiopia. In other words, this is exactly where Arabia would have been on the supercontinent before Peleg was born. And so that could explain the Sheba coming from Ham, the Havilah coming from Ham, the Sheba and the Havilah also coming from Shem. Today, it's just the Red Sea that separates the Horn of Africa and Arabia. Today, it's the Red Sea that says the Horn of Africa, Ethiopia, Somalia is Africa and Arabia is Asia. 
but not on Pangaea, not on the supercontinent, not before Peleg was born and there was a great earthquake that separated the, 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 uh, uh, the continents. And so what you see here on this image, uh, and you can Google images of Pangaea, you might find this image, you can zoom in on the Horn of Africa and you can see where Arabia is seated right there. You can see Arabia, Ethiopia, Somalia, Eritrea, and you can see Yemen, Yemen which has been identified as Havila. And you can see then why Arabia would be considered Africa. All right, go to Genesis 2. Genesis 2. And um, let's look at verse 8. And it reads, The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed and out of the ground, the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It says, now a river went out of Eden to water the garden and from there it parted and became four river heads. The name of the first is Pisan. It is the one which skirts, right? It borders the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. Remember, Havila is coming out of where? Well, we see Havila coming out of Ham, which gives us the northern and northeastern horn of African nations, except for Egypt. That comes out of Mizraim. And then you have Havila also coming from Shem, synonymous with Yemen, right under Arabia. But if you picture that Pangaea image, you can see Ethiopia, Somalia, Eritrea, Arabia, Yemen, they're all together. All together. So this first river, it does what? It skirts the whole land of Havila where there is gold. Right? So many of you, you could, you could be looking, if you're looking on that Pangaea image right now, look at where Havila is. That's Yemen. And then look at that image and then read this verse, the name of the first. This is helping us locate where Eden is. It's the one that skirts the whole land of, of Havila where there is gold. Uh, and the gold of that land is good. Delium and the onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is Gahan. It is the one which goes around the whole land of Cush. Now, here's what's interesting about this. It, says it goes around the whole land of Cush. And the traditional says Ethiopia. We have assumed that Cush is referring to Ethiopia only. But Cush is referring to Sudan, Ethiopia, and the rest of those nations in the Horn of Africa attached right to Arabia on the supercontinent. The name of the second river is Gahon. It is the one which goes around the whole land of Cush. The name of the third river is Hedekel, also known as the Tigris. It is the one which goes toward the east of Assyria. The fourth river is the Euphrates. So this answers that, that question about Arabia and Ethiopia, and once again, going back to, go ahead and just quickly put up that map number seven. There was another image I showed you before of the northern portion of Africa only being considered Libya. So you've got that northern part, which is Libya. You've got Egypt, Mizraim, which connects to Canaan, the Levant, where Israel is today. And then past Mizraim, you have the rest of the Cushite nations. You have Ethiopia and all the nations that came out, connected right over with Arabia. When the Table of Nations was established, or the 70 nations were coming out of the three sons of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, well, the rest of the supercontinent, the rest of the landmass was unoccupied. So some believe Ham fathered all of Africa. Ham didn't father all of Africa. Ham only fathered the northeastern portion. I firmly believe, due to the study of Olauda Equiano, as well as Dr. John Clark and Dr. John Gill, that Abraham, by way of Keturah, one specific grandchild, Ephor, fathered the rest of Africa. And as a result of that, that would mean that the rest of Africa would have what's in Abraham, and what's in Abraham was Eber, and Eber was what? Eber was Hebrew. Now, I'm going to have to stop right now. I was going to take y'all to the black disciple in the book of Acts. 
But we'll pick up next week. Listen, Genesis chapter 11, verse 10. Explains the genealogy of Shem. Shem was a black man in Africa. If you repeat this back, Genesis 14, verse 13. Abraham steps on the scene. Being a descendant of Shem, which is a fact, means Abraham too was black. Abraham, born in the city of a black man, called Nimrod, grandson of Ham. Ham had four sons. One was named Cain. Here, let me do some explaining. Abraham, Isaac was the father. Jacob had 12 sons, for real. And these were the children of Israel. According to Genesis chapter 10, these were the children of Israel. Genesis chapter 10. These were the children of Israel. According to Genesis chapter 10.